first of all, I would just like to th thank Sofia for organizing ICMS again and also for giving me the opportunity to present our work here. So I work in the Fredrik Linders Group at Linköping University in Sweden. And our long-term goal with our research that is to try to make a new type of anti-epileptic drug. And today there are about 6 to 5 million people suffering from epilepsy. And there are two major problems for these patients. And the first one is that many of the existing drugs, they cause very severe side effects. And also that despite treatment, more than 30% of the patients still have seizures. So, so this gives that about 20 to 25 million people are really in urgent need for new and better treatment. And during an epileptic seizure, the electrical signals are sent too easily. So the, as a rule of thumb, the excitability can either be decreased by the blocking of voltage gated sodium channels. Let's see if I can use the paper, please. So either if you block the voltage gated sodium channels and thereby affecting the depolarization, or by opening voltage gated potassium channels and thereby affect either the repolarization or the resting potential. So our target is uh, voltage gated potassium channels. So these are tetrameric channels where each subunit consists of six transmembrane segments where S5 and S6 from the four subunits together form the four domain. And we have S1 to S4 that forms one of the voltage sensors. And in S4, we have these uh, gating charges uh, that really then decides if the channel should be open or closed. So when the inside of the cell is negatively charged, these voltage sensors are pulled down, so they are kept very close to the inside of the, of the cell. And this then will close the gate so no potassium ions can pass through. But when the inside instead becomes positively charged, the S4 moves upwards and that causes a conformational change that opens the gate. And our uh, target, that is the KV7.2 and 7.3 uh, channel. So it's a tetrameric channel um, consisting of these two subunits. So. And it's expressed in the neurons. And this ion channel has a very negative voltage dependence, so it starts to open already at minus 70 millivolt. And thereby it will be partly open already when the neuron is in, uh, is in rest. So thereby it will also then have a function to really set the resting potential and thereby really regulate the excitability of the neuron. So if you have mutations that causes, um, that makes this, function, this ion channel non-functioning, that will actually cause epilepsy. And on the other hand, if you have a compound that instead opens the cyan channel, that can be used to prevent epileptic seizures. And that was done by the drug retigabine that was improved in 2011. It was um, produced by JSK. And it's actually enough just to shift the voltage dependence of this ion channel by as little as 8 millivolts to have a physiological antiepileptic function. So as it is open already at this point, this will really cause a hyperpolarization of the resting potential, thereby making it more difficult for the neuron to fire action potentials. And in particular then this high frequency um, firing that is connected to an epileptic seizure. So Rotiga B uh, was approved for focal epilepsia, so that is when the epilepsy starts in one certain part of the brain. And it had very good effect for these patients, and also for patients that earlier suffered from pharmacoresistency. So retigabine binds to, uh, to the pore domain at this uh, part here. And um, unfortunately, the drug also had several adverse effects. So it was not used very much. And one of the, one of the adverse effects was that it caused different pigment discolorations of the skin and the nails of the patients. And it was also required to take the drug three times a day. And it also caused different urinary disorders. And that was due to an opening effect on the very similar KV7.4 channel. And our aim is to use the knowledge and all the information that we have from the Tigabin, but instead then to create another compound that is much more safe. So we would like to have a compound that have the same or better efficacy as Tigabin. But to avoid this pigment discoloration, we use another chemical identity. And we would also like to have a compound that have a longer half-life. And also an improved selectivity versus KV7.4 to avoid these effects with the urinary disorders. So. And in our lab, we have for a long time used the two-electrode voltage clamp technique, 
where you consequently then express the ion channels in frog eggs. Uh, since a year ago, we also have a Q-patch in the lab that we're using uh, a lot. So then we use instead to express the ion channels in different cell lines. So, and for both these techniques, we are using very, very similar voltage protocols. So we step the voltage and then also make recordings here at one voltage to, for the tail, record, tail currents. And also then, so we do that in control solution. And then we also, let's see what happened. Oops. And then we also apply the compounds and make the same recordings again. And then if we have a compound that have this kind of effect that we're searching for, we would then like to see this shift in the voltage dependence. So that is what we are looking for. So in the lab, we can also do zebrafish larvae recordings. So we can predict an antipoleptic effect of the compounds by making these recordings by the local field potentials recordings. And we are also supported by a platform in Sweden that is called the DDD platform, or the Drug Discovery and Development Platform. So they have helped us for a couple of years now, and so they help us with medicinal chemistry expertise. But we also have a chemist working full-time with our, our project, and they also help us to do the admin profiling and have also made, helped us to make a so target product profile, so TPP, and the candidate drug target profile. And um, for the then the compounds that have been in focus for this collaboration, that is compounds that act by specific mechanism, what we have called the lipoelectric mechanism. So Fredrik has been working with the movement of the voltage sensor for his whole life, I would dare to say, and also with the compounds that affects this movement of the voltage sensor. So quite early, they, he found out the different polyunsaturated fatty acids that have a lipophilic part but also negatively charged head group. That these compounds, they get incorporated into the ion channel or very close then to the voltage sensor. So electrostatically, they really facilitate the upward movement of the voltage sensors. And we searched, we really understood the kind of the, that this could be a very useful mechanism also for other compounds. So both Malin and I, Malin is also here in the audience, we spent our PhD studies to developing other compounds that acted by this same mechanism. And then we found out that naturally occurring resin acids that are, exist in different pine trees, in the resin from pine trees, that they could be modified to actually act as openers of the different of KV channels. So. And we have had a very good collaboration also to start with with the chemists at our university. So we have synthesized more than 250 derivatives of these compounds. So we have quite a good view of the structure activity relationships for these compounds. So lately we have then also worked with then with the KV7.2, 7.3 channel. And due to the kind of mechanism of action, we know that our compounds, they need to be negatively charged to act as activators. And if they are uncharged, they have no effect at all. So by turning this DHAA, the naturally occurring compound, into what we have called VU161, that then ha instead from the carboxyl group as a permanent negatively charged group, and also then on a small, on a short stalk, that kind of changes the distance between this lipophilic part and the negative charge, we could actually turn these compounds into fairly potent openers of the KV7.2, 7.3 channel. And the naming of these compounds is consequently because our chemist is named Wu in his family name. So um, these compounds, they do shift the voltage dependence of activation. So this was the effect, as we then said, that we were searching for for these compounds. So, and for the antiepileptic effect, it is actually the shift in voltage dependence that is the most important effect. So that is why we are focusing on the shifts in voltage dependence for these uh, compounds. So we have actually used, uh, instead of using the EC50 values, we have instead used um, another kind of way to uh, summarize the effects, and that is instead of therapeutic concentration. So consequently then the concentration of the compound that is needed to shift the voltage dependence to 8 millivolt. So um, we have worked with these compounds and also then found the binding site for them on the ion channel. And as I mentioned earlier, that Rutiga bean binds to a site here in the pore domain. 
our compounds instead act on the voltage sensor and the uppermost gating charge in particular. So that we can see here that for a Tiga beam, when mutate this residue, the effect disappears completely, but it does not affect the effect of our compounds. So. But instead, when we neutralize the uppermost gating charge, we could see that the effect of our compounds is clearly reduced. It doesn't disappear completely, and most probably because the compound also interacts with the next gating charge that is below it. So we have continued to work with these compounds, and also then by introducing different halogens on this lipophilic part. So by introducing this halogen here, and also making small changes of the, of the negatively charged group, we could actually turn these compounds into molecules that are as potent openers as retigabine. So that was one of our kind of goals with this project. And as I mentioned also that this effect on the KV7.4 is extremely important also to keep track on all the time for these compounds. And retigabine is unfortunately a very potent opener of this ion channel. So it particularly um, has, it has two effects. So it does shift the voltage dependence, but as we can see here for the unfilled circles, that the effect in the voltage dependence is smaller on KV7.4 than on the target for a tigabin. But in contrast, it actually induces a very large increase of the maximum conductance. So most probably because these channels, they are flickering a lot. And uh, so thereby, it's, when it's stabilizing, it's in the open state, this will have a huge effect for the, for the maximum conductance. So already at the therapeutic concentration, it's actually more than twofold increase of the maximum conductance by Otigabin. So this is the, why we think it had such a good, such a undesired effect then on the smooth muscle cells in the, uh, for example, then in the bladder causing these urinary problems. And then if we compare with the results for our compound, for V200 here, uh, our compounds do cause a shift in the voltage dependence. And we see no differences for this compound between the two uh, channels. But we do not have this increase of the maximum conductance at all. Um, so this, for us, would support that, the, um, that our compounds have a better selectivity profile. Because also, I have to mention that for this effect on KV7.4, the, um, it is physiologically relevant at a more positive voltage. So that will also make this in increase in maximum conductance even more important than the shift. So we had a collaboration with Tom Jeps lab in Copenhagen. So he helped us to do recordings on smooth uh, muscle cells and then we used mesenteric arteries. And then we could see that retigabin induced the contraction at a lower concentration than our compounds. So this would indicate that our compound would have a smaller effect also on smooth muscles ex expressed in the bladder. Um, so from this point, we have continued to do other development with our compounds. So then in collaboration with this DDD platform, as I mentioned. And we have also now tested all our compounds using the q patch that we have in the lab. And interestingly, we do not see any difference at all between the expression system for our compounds, but for retigabine and also other, other groups of compounds, we see quite a big difference in the affinity for these compounds. And today we are not really sure the reason to this, but we are working with it. Um, but it's a very interesting feature, I would say, there. So thanks to this collaboration with DDD, we have now also tested uh, other, other types of compounds. So in addition to retigabine, we have also tested a second generation of retigabine that is not developed by us. So then we could see that this kind of pattern to have a larger effect on the ion channel when it's expressed in the, in the cell lines than in the oocytes, it also follows for the second generation retigabine molecule. But for our compounds, we see then no difference at all between these uh, selection between these expression systems. So here we show data for VU200 and also for a bunch of new compounds that have been synthesized. And also then to be able to compare these different effects on the KV7.4 when we have the increase in the maximum conductance and also then the shifts. 
we defined a new way to summarize these effects in what we have called the KV7.4 selectivity factor. So then we compare the current increase by this therapeutic concentration. And so we compare them between the increase on the KV7.2, 7.3, and then divide it by the increase on the KV7.4 channel. So then if you have a value at one here, that indicates that the effect is as big on both channels. So, and of course then you would like this value to be as high as possible. And for retigabine, and also this second generation retigabine, we can see that it has really the same effect on both these ion channels. Whilst our compounds, or at least some of them, have a better selectivity profile. But today we don't really know how, how much bigger it has to be to really have good enough or to be selective enough. So that is also one of the reasons why we are planning to do more recordings on, on bladder tissues also. So we have also tested the effects of these compounds uh, on our zebrafish larvae model. So in this model, we actually pretreat the fish or the zebrafish larvae uh, for 18 to 24 hours before we do the recordings, and then we induce epileptic seizures with a compound called PTZ, so that effect, it affects the GABA. So then we have also then according to the literature defined what we define what we define as an epileptic activity and then it should have a specific pattern for the for the firing and also then a certain length of it so then we compare the the effects with control solution and then after apply, if we have kind of pretreated them these fishes then with these compounds and also, since we pretreat them for this long time, this would actually also function as a quite good toxicology model for us. So it's quite easy for us to see compounds all the there that have the potential to be a bit toxic. So then we have compared the lowest concentration that was required for, is it freezing? I think it says that it's time for coffee, or? <laughs> Do you know that again? <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, it seems to be frozen. Yeah, so then we could actually see that some of our compounds actually had an antipoleptic effect at concentrations lower than retigabine. Still not lower than the second generation of retigabine. But that was also one of our kind of aims, well, goals with this project to find compounds that have that same effect. Yeah, it seems to be frozen. Yeah, it seems like that. But I think it's so. Um, I can just also mention that we have to kind of also to continue with our drug discovery and development. We have started a company, Multic Pharma, and uh, to be able then also to do some more processing with the compounds. So, and we are searching for partners with a pharma company to be able to also then to have a better collaboration with someone that really has all this infrastructure and uh, that could be um, very suitable for us. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's okay. So uh, I think that is the last slide um, today then, <laughs> it seems like. <laughs> or is it starting? No. Okay, but I think that, Malin, you have to help me now with the last slide here if I don't remember all the details in it. So at least we then have compounds that have the same effect on this antiepileptic model as the as retigabine, so that was one of our goals. And also, since we have a completely different chemical identity, we don't expect them to cause this blue color, this, this blue discoloration. And for, for the moment, we seem to have a better KV7.4 selectivity, but we cannot be sure yet, so we have to continue with these, uh, these ex um, investigations there. And also that we, at this point, we don't know if... Uh, oh, good. Good. So, uh, and we don't know if our compounds have a long half-life or not enough, but we are actually waiting for the results from our first PK study in mice. And uh, I hope to have the results to present for you today, but 
seems like they have not really, maybe they got stuck in the train or something, I don't know. Uh, so um, hopefully we will have, let's see here. Yeah. So we will hopefully know that during the summer at least, if, if how they behave kind of for the, for the half time. And yeah. And so here also is, the, here you see Frederick and also Malin. And also I would like to thank the people that have been involved in this project. So it's partly then people working in Frederick's group and we're the ones with the blue uh, text have been generating data for this that I presented here today. And also then the other collaboration with Tom Jeps in Copenhagen and also the people at SciLife Lab the, at the platform. And also for our very good collaboration with Sofian. And also Saniona and Bises for collaborations with airlines. And thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Nina, for a very interesting talk and very well handled in the end. <laughs> Excellent. Um, right at the back first, and then we'll come back here. Uh, Ian Greenwood, St George's. Um, Nina, lovely talk, great presentation, super clear. Very simple question. So as you know, um, a lot of mutation, a lot of epilepsies are caused by mutations to KCNQ 2 and 3. Yeah. Do you have any idea what your compounds do to epilepsy-causing mutations? That's a very good idea. So I would say that if the mutation would be like on the expression level, that it's decreased, then I think these compounds could be very helpful. And we actually do have some preliminary data from the lab for us that we have tested a few epilepsy-causing mutations, and then we see very positive effects of our compounds. So, but it's a very good question, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Tony. The microphone is coming. One I second. I use my voice. I think we need to do the microphone because of the recording. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Can we reach this one? Uh, Emilio Carbone from Torino. Uh, uh, it's a very nice presentation. Oh, your compounds, compared to reticabine, mm. uh, if you tested on neurons, on firing neurons, how it works? Works the same? I mean, if you have a firing neuron, you can uh, block it? Yeah, exactly. So we tested... Like, like the brain... Uh, Break. Yeah, exactly. So it's a very good question. So we tested it on DRGs, so, so dorsal root ganglions, mm -hmm. uh, some years ago. And then this, actually, this compound VU200, uh, it had a very, very similar effect as retigabine. What about the concentration? You have to use higher concentration or lower? Actually not. Uh, so it was on very similar concentration. So it more follows the pattern for the zebrafish larvae experiments. So it could uh, work better in clinics, I mean, on trials. It could be that, yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, we don't know, as I said, we don't know the reason for the differences in the concentration dependencies be between the two expression systems, mm -hmm. but maybe the truth is somewhere in between them, I would say. Thank you. But very good okay. question, yeah. Uh, Tony Lewis from Portsmouth. Uh, I have two points. Um, the first one is the difference between the expression systems. So the xenoposuocytes express endogenously KCNE subunits, so you might find that the difference between the two, sub the two lines is the expression mm. of KCNE, so if you express K the KB7s That's with, a with the good MERP, point. Yeah. Um, that it might change the, the yeah. pharmacology. And the second point is, um, so retigabine is, um, works on the KB7s, but not on KB7.1, because it doesn't have that tryptophan. Yeah. Um, but you didn't show any data as to the effect of the drugs on, so on KV7.1. So does it cause any effects and will it cause any cardiac arrhythmias? So um, unfortunately, I only have preliminary data for the KV7.1 or the IKS current. So that's why I didn't include them in this presentation. So it seems like some of our compounds may act as openers also of the IKS or IKS. Uh, but not all of them, and it does not really follow the same pattern as for the kind of effects on the KV7.2, 7.3. But it's a ver very good point, and of course that is something that we need to keep track of, just as for the selectivity for the KV7.4. So it's, yeah. I think one last question. Yeah, thank you. 
Mass Korsgaard, um, very nice presentation. And I was wondering the increase in conductance you see with your compound. Are you sure that that is increased conductance by means of increased open state probability, or could it be trafficking, bringing more channels uh, to the membrane? Have you looked into single channel recordings to see, to check? First? No, we have not looked into single channel recordings, uh, but these effects are, I would say, immediate. So in particular, when we apply the compounds to the oocytes, then you can really follow it immediately. And then we see this large increase extremely quickly. Okay. And then, I mean, the expression could yeah. have to it be... It takes probably longer. Yeah. Yeah. Slightly longer, yeah. But it's a very good uh, question, yeah. One last question. Just in the middle of the back. Hi, thanks for a talk, uh, great talk, uh, Russell, Charles River Laboratories. Um, you said you were awaiting PK data from your compounds, but based on their physchem properties, uh, are they predicted to get into the brain? Yes, they are. So uh, these compounds that I showed you for the structure, they are not predicted to enter the, the brain since they are permanent and negatively charged. So, but the compounds that we have continued to work with then uh, at least the CACU2 data and also uh, other kind of assays, they indicate that they will enter the brain. But of course, that is something that we really cross our fingers. So, so your med chem support has gone through some optimization for those properties? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. We're yeah. finished there. Thank, Thank you. you.